Thank you, Mr. Uh, Professor Flynn. This is uh, Senator Troy Jackson. Uh, How you doing, Senator? I'm here, uh, Chairman of the Citizen Trade Policy Commission. We have a full staff here. Great. We're uh, very excited to hear what you have to tell us today about uh, the CAFTA and the Trans-Pacific Partnership as it pertains to pharmaceuticals. Uh, Great. And we're all ears. So let me, let me just outline what the, the overall concern is. The overall concern that has developed over the last five or six years or so is that the, the pharmaceutical industry is pressuring the U.S. to push, to move towards a new international trade agreement that would restrain pharmaceutical uh, price restricting programs in the U.S. and abroad. That's their goal. Um, that goal is evident from the recent submission that was filed with the USTR by the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association uh, yesterday in what's called the Special 301 process, where they spend most of their submission outlining concerns they have with public drug reimbursement programs around the world that pressure their prices lower and therefore, in their view, extract a taking of their intellectual property. Now, the the specific steps that the and then so that's the overall um, agenda of the pharmaceutical companies. This has been expressed in a um, in a specific proposal that's put been put forward by Pfizer, that was joined by then um, Stanford professor John Barton, outlining um, just in, in abstract detail the outline of an of an international agreement that would restrain. Um, pharmaceutical price price restraining policies, whether they be through Im reimbursements or direct price controls, various things, um, in wealthy countries, including the United States. So there's a, there's an outline of a policy, and there is various um, uh, pieces along the way where officials within the United States Trade Representative have expressed sympathy for various aspects of this policy. And have began and have begun to put some of it in place in various trade agreements. So the the first time this policy came up was in the Australia Free Trade Agreement six years ago or so, and that was the first free trade agreement to have a a, a specific pharmaceutical chapter. It outlined a series of of what were then ultimately procedural restrictions carefully drafted to, to be targeted at Australia's um, pharmaceutical reimbursement program. The, Australia has what most public health officials consider to be the best pharmaceutical reimbursement program in the world, and the main attribute of that program is that it sets reimbursement rates within its public sector based on expert, qual expert qualifications of the um, efficacy of the medicine rather than through market power. And so through that program, a patented medicine that's no better than, than a medicine that's, that's already on the market will not necessarily receive a higher reimbursement rate, for instance, just because it's new. Um, now, the, so the Australia uh, Free Trade Agreement had a series of restrictions. They're mainly about transparency and input into the process and basically having kind of pharmaceutical companies be a seat at the table, so to speak. Um, and, and but there was a problem with it in that it it said that it applied to the federal level health programs in each country and didn't express how that would affect Medicaid programs. That ambiguity is still there. That concern is still there. The next free trade agreement to be negotiated was the Korea Free Trade Trade Agreement, and that free trade agreement took took another step towards. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies' of agenda of having these kind of international level substantive restrictions on pharmaceutical pricing programs. That free trade agreement included a requirement that each country within reimbursement programs have an appeal process, that pharmaceutical companies could appeal the reimbursement price that was set by public health officials. And it created a new substantive standard that those reimbursement programs had to appropriately value patented medicines. So it creates a, a, a litigation, an opportunity for pharmaceutical company litigation over reimbursement rates, and it creates a new, extremely vague, not defined substantive standard that there's something about appropriately valuing patented medicines within, that, within those programs. 
Now, that, that FTA, after um, advocacy by various state government officials, included a footnote carving out explicitly Medicaid from the operation of that program. It's extremely important just in the short term because Medicaid, as, as many of you I'm sure know, um, operates with preferred drug price listing programs and is itself a reimbursement program. And those preferred drug price lists work in essentially the same exact way as the, the, as the foreign company, as the foreign country reimbursement programs that are being targeted by pharma and by USTR. And that's the concern that, that starting in Australia and, and coming through with Korea and to the present day, states have started to bring up to USTR that they are, by climbing on to this uh, pharmaceutical company agenda and by, and by starting to implement facets of it, they're putting in place substantive standards restricting reimbursement programs that restrict that the standards themselves are not complied with by pharmaceutical reimbursement programs in the U.S., and specifically Medicaid. So there is an acknowledgement of that problem within Korea, which, re which resulted in a footnote carving out Medicaid from the program. But more recently, the, um, the administration has engaged in a new uh, free trade agreement, which is now the TPP. So it's the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. It's unique in that it includes a large number of countries. It includes Australia, which, has, which still has a strong reimbursement program that the pharmaceutical uh, companies are still upset about. It includes New Zealand, which has a reimbursement program that's similar to Australia. And it also includes a lot of poor countries, Vietnam, Malaysia, Peru. The pharmaceutical industry has submitted comments to USTR asking for the same Korea standard with, um, with an appeal right and a substantive standard requiring countries to adequately value patented medicines within reimbursement prices. They've added a new standard that they're asking for, which they call freedom to prescribe, which is not defined, but you can, you can read various things into that language. What, what I think they ultimately want is for there to be no restrictions within reimbursement programs on what drugs doctors can prescribe. At least in its strongest formulation, it would probably make PDLs illegal because what PDLs, uh, preferred drug price lists, do is they set lists of preferred drugs within Medicaid reimbursement programs. And if a doctor wants to prescribe a drug off that list, they may, but they have to go through additional levels of approval. And so we have to ask ourselves whether, whether that would qualify as a freedom to prescribe law or whether this new standard would, would strike it at that component of Medicaid as well. Of course, from the industry's perspective, they would like to strike at that. In the, in the past, when preferred drug price lists were put into effect in states across the country, they litigated against those programs all the way to the Supreme Court, trying to make preferred drug price lists illegal under a theory that Medicaid required freedom to prescribe and the preferred drug price lists were infringing upon that freedom. So it's, it's on the record <laughs> that they would love to use this kind of a standard to get rid of those kind of programs. We had a, a meeting representing the Forum on Democracy and Trade and the National Legislation, Legislative Association, Association on Prescription Drug Prices. Um, myself and, and some other people had a meeting with USTR, um, about a week and a half ago, and we asked them um, to go on the record with their statement on whether they are considering uh, a, a pharmaceutical chapter within the TPP agreement. And in a very finely worded statement, which, which was on the record, and I can, I can quote to you, I can send it to you if you want the exact language, they essentially stated, stated that they were in the internal process right now within the administration of deciding whether to include a pharmaceutical chapter within their, um, within their demands for the TPP, that, that other countries sign on to that. The negotiators are in Chile right now, today, uh, negotiating this agreement. The TPP is being negotiated, as other free trade agreements, entirely in secret. There is text um, that the negotiators are using, but that text is not being disclosed 
to the public. There are um, state officials who have access to that text um, through the uh, formal advisory process, uh, but I have not spoken to those people. We're, we're still um, trying to get to those people, and, and, and we're in the educational process of trying to inform people who are part of the process about these issues. And, and so to just kind of conclude about where we are, I think we essentially have two concerns. There's a short-term concern and a long-term concern. And these have been expressed in letters from uh, the governor in, of Maine and the governor of Vermont last year in the special 301 process and, and through uh, the National Legislation, Legislative Association on Prescription Drug Prices and, and other individual states and collections of states. And, and the concerns um, are basically summarized like this. In the the long-term concern is that is that states really are and should be opposed to the overall agenda. That the shift of trade agreements to create a new international framework restricting drug reimbursement programs is not in the best interests of states. That the overall goal of the companies pushing that program. Is, is to cover states and the federal government and other countries and to create a new international framework that would restrict the ability of states to respond to higher prices for patented medicines with, with a variety of regulatory tools. And that overall agenda, regardless of what the fine specifics of each proposal look like right now, the overall agenda is something that can't possibly be in the best interests of state governments or American consumers. That's kind of the the long-term larger interest. The shorter-term interest is is we can't um, we we cannot get USTR to go on the record to state that it's not pushing a proposal in in this specific agreement coming up now. And um, so we would we would like to see that agreement. <laughs> we would like um, we would like to ensure. Um, that ideally there's no pharmaceutical chapter in the agreement, that the, the position of states is to oppose the chapter uh, writ large. And then I suppose our kind of third level demand is to ensure at minimum that there's, there's some kind of carve out of states, although I think the position has evolved such that, that there's a recognition that the carve out um, at, at best only gets you by one agreement, you know, that the overall agenda is, is um, the overall agenda does not include a, a desire to continually carve out states. And in fact, if you look at pharmaceutical industry's latest submissions, they don't they don't ask for a carve out for states. Um, it's obviously not in not in their interest. So that's pretty much where we are, and I'm, I'd be happy to open it up for some some questions on the on the details or the overall framework. Thank you. 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 Thank you.